Shabbat shalom. I hope you are prospering and in health even as your soul's prospering. Is your soul prospering? Yeah. Then everything else should too. Yeah. Hallelujah. We're um, about to start this message today on April the 14th. And it is give us our daily bread number two. Number two. So if you want to read some scripture with me, I'm going to read from Matthew 6, 9 through 13 first. And just do a little bit of review uh, from last week and then go forward into this. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. And before I start, I'm going to pray. Father, I just give you glory and praise and honor. You are the Almighty and the dominion over all things is yours. The things in the earth, under the earth, and in the heavens, they are all under your dominion. And you rule everything by the authority of your spoken word. We give you glory. We give you praise. Not one thing escapes your attention. Not one activity of ours or the enemy escapes your attention. And Father, in every circumstance and in every situation, in Messiah, we have victory. Hallelujah. I thank you for a victory, Father. A past victory, present victory, and victories to come. Hallelujah. You are trustworthy in everything. And we give you the glory right now. You give God glory. Shout amen. amen. Shout amen. amen. I'm going to tell you in the middle of a battle, that's your cry. Praise to God. Hallelujah. Give us this day our daily bread. This is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think we ought to include that more often in our prayers than we think we should. Verse 11 says, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Say, the, deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Say His kingdom. His, kingdom. His, power. His power. His glory. His glory. Forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we overfocus on the negative stuff uh, instead of the positive stuff. I don't want to be guilty of doing that. I want you to know this, that in this model prayer, there's a specific prayer not to be led into temptation, but deliver us not from evil, but the evil one. Uh, in review from last week, we looked at the Hebrew word for bread, lahem. It's Strong's number 3899, and it comes from Strong's 3898. So you have number 3899, and 3898 is the root word for the, for the word bread. Reading straight from the Strong's typed into my notes. Number 3898 is a primary root. It means to feed on. Figuratively to consume. By implication to battle. And in parentheses as destruction. Parentheses closed. Devour. Eat. Fight or fighting, overcome, prevail, make war or warring. And that is also a part of the, the word 38, 3901. It means to battle a war. So summarizing the book, what I taught on this last Sabbath was that when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we are actually saying, as well as give us bread to eat, we are saying, give us today the battle that leads to victory. Give us this day our battle. In other words, Father, we're in a battle, and I want to win today. Amen. I don't want to lose. I don't want to get a partial victory. I want the complete and absolute victory in Messiah. I want total victory to the glory of God. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some insights with you that I have learned over the course of time in spiritual warfare. And um, uh, 
I'm going to teach it to you from the scripture. And I realized last week, when I started to teach on spiritual warfare, guess what was going to happen? <laughs> spiritual warfare. Ask me if I'm smiling. I'm smiling. Because I've been, I'm not a newbie at it. And I'm not, I'm not trying to promote myself what I'm saying. I just didn't start in this warfare thing last week or last month. 37 years ago is when I entered into the war. And it's intensified ever since. I know that unless I can win the battle, I'm not going to make the progress. <coughs> the battle is, is the enemy's tactic, his scheme to keep me from, from demonstrating greater authority and greater power in the spirit realm. Uh, one of the things that happened this week, and, uh, you know, I knew when I taught on that, and even when I said this statement, I'm not comfortable if things are uncomfortable. If I go for a long time and I don't perceive there's any kind of warfare going on, I'm probably being compromised in my life. You know what I'm saying? You have to get used to battle. You signed up for battle when you got born again. You just didn't get all the fine print right there. It's a galactic war. It's been going on before time. And I knew that there was going to be some uncomfortability with it. I mean, when I was telling, when I was saying that statement last week in the service, I'm having thoughts before I say it, so you know this is going to, it's going to stir up some stuff when you say this. And then when I finished saying it, and I had time to process it. I was talking to you, but I was processing in real time what the Spirit was saying to me. And He was saying, you know this is going to happen. And when I finished, to make sure I got the message, I mean, you have to hear it twice sometimes in the air. I knew that there was going to be some warfare from it. But I decided I'm not going to draw back. I'm not of those who pull back when, when difficult things happen. You're not either, are you? And so I had an encounter Monday night or Tuesday night. I don't really, didn't really keep up with it. But I uh, actually encountered what is a spirit being. Now, they're deceiving, so you never can really tell everything about them. But his name is Baphomet. He's the goat goddess. He's a sexual goddess. God. Little G. And there was a physical altercation with this spirit. And I want to urge you to learn. So this is the reason I feel the Holy Spirit's having me tell you this. Those fallen spirits have an anti-anointing. They have an anti-anointing. That is, they have a presence that can be mesmerizing. They have a presence of an anti-anointing. And you have to be able in the moment discern what is happening, where it's coming from, and how to respond to it just like that. You have to decide, discern, discriminate, and judge. You can decide what's the source of this. You got to discern whether it's if they're using the word against you, which is very common for the, that realm. You've got to decide if that's the right spirit with that word. You've got to discriminate. You've got to say, okay, if, if do I witness against what this spirit is saying to me? And do I witness with what the spirit of truth is saying to me? Which one is which? And then you've got to judge. Listen to me. You've got to judge which one is which and deal with them. And you've got to be mature enough. You've got to be alert spiritually enough. You've got to be whole in your spirit, soul, and body enough that they don't have a place in you. Because if they have a place in you, they're going to take you to task. And the Father doesn't want us to draw back from battle. Now I'm going to tell you some other things that, that I dealt with this week. And you might just say this is the weather. 
the wind. Anybody notice the gust and strength of the wind in the last three, two or three days? I believe the Spirit has shown me that, that is, some of that is a natural phenomenon. But some of that is the volume of angelic movement in this nation. Both positive movement, that is, Jehovah's angels, and those angels that serve the fallen one. They are ministering spirits. They move like wind. They have an anointing, but it's an anti-anointing. And they are reshifting. And it, some of it may have been in regard just to what happened in Syria. I don't know that. But I'm just saying there's been a massive move in this nation, in the spirit realm, in the last few days. Now you just have to test that. I know that's a prophetic thing. You just have to test that. But I felt that. And then I had some dreams this week about some tsunamis. And they were coming and I saw one of them. And then I had this scene where... Um, I'm getting all these gold coins falling out of this machine. And this other guy's helping me and he's getting the rest of them out. And then I saw another tsunami. And it was coming in the rain. And I don't believe it was actual water. I, I saw the water in one of them. But I believe it's the wave of the uh, spirit realm of what's coming into this nation. It is already here. And I felt like the spirit, I'm submitting this for testing a prophetic word to you. But I felt like the way we're going to know what is going on and when it's time to make some relocating decisions is that you are going to understand and feel the intensity of the atmosphere increase. That is, you're going to, you're going to feel intensity in the spirit realm around you and around your environment. And the thing that the Father gave me in a natural, I think, to confirm it is how many of you know somebody that when the when a front moves through and the barometric pressure changes, they have all kinds of sinus reactions to it? How many of you know somebody like that? This is what is a natural example of what I feel like the Spirit was telling me this week that we're going to have to we're going to discern because the intensity of what is happening will continue to increase to a point that we will know it. Hallelujah. So test that. Um, I want to ask this question, and I don't expect a hand raise on this or nothing, so I'm just kind of giving you a heads up. Are you or someone you know who is a believer is afraid of the devil or spiritual warfare? Are you or someone you know that is a believer afraid of the devil or spiritual warfare? That type of fear is not from the Father. And you've got to dis decide, discern, discriminate, and judge that fear. I remember specifically years ago when I was struggling through these things and, you know, yada, yada, yada. End point. I had to decide the Spirit. I remember the Spirit telling me, Mark, You've got to be able to decide what's going on or you cannot respond correctly. I have to know what's going on inside of me and I have to know what's going on around me in the environment that I'm in. And if I can't define what's going on inside of me and what's going on around me, I, there's no way I can accurately deal with it. And the intensity of the times and days that we live in, perilous, stressful times, is we've got to be discerning. You've got to decide, discern, discriminate, and judge and do it quickly. I only asked one person this question face to face and they said, yeah, I know people like that. So I want to encourage you. Fear should have zero tolerance in your life. Now, I'm not speaking ethereal, can't get a handle on it stuff. I'm talking about where you really live and what you really deal with. You cannot afford to be fearful. So bring that fear to the Father and say, Father, you know I fear this. Just be honest and humble and bring it to Him and let Him begin to deal with you about it. And you may be shocked at His way of dealing with you about it. 
the way he started dealing with me about fear was he, he made me so uncomfortable that I couldn't sit at home at night and watch Matt Block reruns, but I had to go to this public square and tell somebody about the master. I wish you was there. My family, I've told you this before, but I'll tell you again to the audience on the, on the internet. I would be sitting at home with my mom and my dad. They'd be sitting in their recliners. I'd be sitting on the couch. And I don't know what was happening with them, but I don't know what was happening with me. I was under such conviction, you thought Billy Green was in the room or something. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to get up and leave my house at 9 o'clock at night. And I'd go out on the street and I'd start, first time I couldn't even get out of my car. But I went anyway. Now as I progressed, I was able to get out and then able to talk to one or two or five at a time and get thrown questions at me I didn't even know the answer to. But I began to press in and to face that fear. I didn't know it at the time. I thought I was being in the ministry. I was really being taught how to deal with fear. I mean, I'm just saying, we got to deal with it. And there are levels. There are other levels of fear you've got to deal with. So don't tolerate fear. Uh, the concept that I talked about last week of examining yourselves is dealing with this fear. Most people deal very intensely with fear. It's a normal, common thing that especially uh, women and men, everybody deals with it. But it's whether you finish dealing with it is the real question. And you've got to come to a place where it no longer can sway you. Um, you need to be able to decide to serve, discriminate, and judge why things are happening and the way they are happening. Or you'll not be able, according to the truth and the Spirit, both capital letters, truth and Spirit, respond scripturally. When you are respond spirit, scripturally by the Spirit, the victory is ours in the Messiah. Hallelujah. Another, one of the insights that I want to share, you're dealing with warfare. And I want to look at, and I didn't get time to type this, uh, notes in my scripture, but if you will turn to Matthew chapter 4, I want to talk to you about this. This will help give you a heads up. This is very practical warfare information. I have tested and tried this for a long, long time. I'm going to read from chapter 3 through verse 17 first, and then I'm going to talk about chapter 4. It's keeping the, the truth in the context of the scripture around it. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 13 it says, When Yeshua came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? Verse 15, And Yeshua, but Yeshua answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. One of the key truths about water baptism is it fulfills righteousness because it's a requirement of Scripture. It's a command. Verse 16. When he had been baptized, Yeshua came up immediately from the water. Now listen to what happened. And behold, the heavens were open to him. So the sky rolled back and he could see right into the heaven. When it says heaven here, it's talking about God's throne area. It's not talking about the second heaven, stars and moon and planets and universe and galaxies and all that kind of stuff. He's talking about seeing into the very throne room of the Father. The heavens were open to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. He actually saw the Spirit come down from heaven and rest upon himself. And then, it, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son and whom I am well pleased. Now, I just want to say something here. I'd be edifying if all that happened to you, wouldn't it? I mean, you'd be kind of, you'd be, you'd be edifying. You'd be built up at that point, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd be like, wow, the heavens open. I saw the throne. Here comes the Spirit. It landed on me. And then the Father defies reality and speaks and says, this is my beloved Son. 
in whom I'm well pleased. What a powerful spiritual experience, huh? All right? How many of us have had very powerful spiritual experiences? Come on, most everybody, right? What I want you to make notice of here is he, I mean, that's the top spiritual experience the Father says from heaven audibly, you're my son and I love you. Right in front of everybody. I mean, that's huge. What happens next? He's driven into the wilderness, told not to eat food, probably not drinking water either, for 40 days. Satan and the devil himself show up. Hello? And he has to deal with this character with no food and water for 40 days. He has to deal with this. And he rebukes him every time and gets the victory and then tells Satan to be gone. There's something there that when he changes from devil to Satan, I don't know what all that's about. There's definitely a difference going on there. He went from the one of the highest spiritual edifying experiences you could imagine into the, one of the most intense warfare situations you can come up with. Here's what I want you to learn. Here's what I've learned. That when you and I, we go in our prayer closet, we come out filled with God, and we walk down the street, and there's every devil and his brother down there waiting for us to show up. That's start giving you a hard time. Typically, following a great spiritual victory, there is some spiritual warfare coming right behind it. Why do you think you got edified before it happened? It's because the Father knew it was going to happen and He wanted to fill you up with the Spirit. He wanted to get you edified so that when you walked into that devil's den, if you will, you're ready and prepared to deal with it. Summarizing that when you and I have really high spiritual encounters and experience and edification, do not lay your weapons down. Don't lay them down. Here's my advice. Get alone after you've had this great spiritual experience and give God every credit and dime's worth of goodness out of that whole situation. Stay there till you're built up again. Don't even talk to people or go outside. You know what I'm saying? Just don't even do it. But get filled back. Just get that off of you. Get ready and know that the enemy comes immediately to take that which way has been sown into your heart. Do you hear that? Second example. We need at least two or three examples. Peter. Acts chapter 4. Everybody's quoted and wants to say, silver and gold I have none but what I have I give you. Rise up and walk in the name of the Master Messiah. Doesn't everybody want to do that? Within a few days, he's in jail. Him and his buddy. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't enough just to say it, but your buddy, if he's hanging out with you, he's going to jail too. And they beat him. So what I'm telling you is, there's. I want you to understand, because if you don't understand what's going on, you can't respond correctly to the situation. And you have to know that when you, when Father edifies you and builds you up, it's for this next season of warfare that you're going to deal with. Now, there's not that it's always warfare. There's R&R &R in the Spirit. There's times when, you know, there's days or week or whatever or something, you know, some short relatively period of time. Well, there's no warfare going on. But for the most part, there's a war going on. And so I just have one Heads up. When you have a super spiritual encounter, just know that it's very possible that the enemy's got you on target because of that, and he's coming to steal that away from you. Hallelujah. Um, if you stand firm and are not moved, you will win an additional victory and consequently exercise greater authority over the dark spiritual realm. He, Yeshua, dealt with, and I don't know that any of us will ever have to do this, but he faced Satan, the devil, face to face. I don't know that we'll ever have to deal with that. I mean, 
you know, the end of is going to be a throne full with Satan himself. So that may be an exclusion there. But for the most part, we don't have to deal with it like he did. And so, just stay humble. Give God the credit for the good thing that he just gave you. And be prepared that warfare may just be coming your way. Now, <clears throat> there's a ton, two or three other things that I've learned in warfare that I want to tell you today. You may already know these things, but I feel led to tell you. When I was really naive, just new in the, in, in the spirit, new in the things of the kingdom of God, I th literally thought if I ignore spiritual warfare, it'll go away. I did. There was a point in time back when where I thought, I'll just ignore this stuff. I'll just focus on the positive, happy-go-lucky, everything, it'll all be good, and I, this won't bother me. If I don't adjust the devil, maybe he'll just leave me alone. That's not a key, not activity. It's, it's ignorant. Let just put it that way. It's naive. That's not going to happen. He doesn't have any mercy or kindness for you or for your house or anything that's yours. He is bent on stealing, stealing, killing, stealing, and destroying. The second one was, this one took me a little longer to deal with, if I live a good life or if I walk in obedience to all the known truth that I have, there will be no war for me. That is, if I'm, if I'm doing everything the Word and the Spirit have gotten me to do and to live by, then I'll be exempt from spiritual warfare. Friends, that's not the case. It's not the case at all. Another one is, uh, the last one is, if I lead the devil, demons, in Ephesians 6 group, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wicked in high places, if I leave them alone, they'll leave me alone. It's not true. That. It's just not true. It's just not true. And you know, um, your obedience to truth and the Spirit in this life will probably draw warfare, not make you exempt. It will actually draw the attention of the enemy to you because he sees what Jehovah is doing and he knows that the more confidence, the more boldness, the more whole you are, the more you can address his kingdom and he loses greater losses. Ask Job. Job was doing everything right. Scripture says so. But he ended up in warfare against his family. Hello? Against his family? Hello? Against his health? Hello? Against his finances? Hello? He was doing everything right. He was doing everything right. And he drew warfare. Massive warfare. I mean, I don't want to go negative, but he lost family members. He lost land, wealth, houses, and stuff. He lost health temporarily. Temporarily. Because the way he was living drew warfare. The way you and I have chosen to live draws warfare. The redemptive purpose in that is that Yahweh wants to show his glory through humanity. And that is the place that the enemy lost. And the place that Yahweh has given to his people. Don't draw back because more for how many times have I and you, and I know that's bad grammar, we not did what we, the Spirit and truth were telling us to do because we entered some level of warfare. You didn't witness, you didn't give, you didn't pray. You didn't prophesy. You didn't lay hands on the sick. You didn't show up for a service. Because of the warfare. We are not 
not living a natural life in a natural world. We are living a spiritual life in a natural world. And the forces of wickedness hate the way you live. They hate the way I live. They want to kill, steal, and destroy. They want to make you sick without recovery. But if we don't draw back and we press into the kingdom, especially when things are, you know, it's almost a dead giveaway when you experience that level of warfare. Do what you don't want to do right now. They're trying to talk you out. Listen to me. They're trying to talk you out of you doing what you should be doing. That's what they're doing. They're trying to talk you out See, you've got to be able to decide, discern, discriminate, and judge. Judge means you've got to render a decision. And when the enemy starts battling you to keep you from making the right decision that you know you should be making, when he starts battling over that, you've got to be able to judge that that's him trying to talk you out of it. And then you need to go on in and obey. Go on and do what the Scripture knows is right because you, if you're obeying the Spirit and the truth, you will <coughs> walk in the victory. And the enemy will be ashamed. Timothy says when we speak up, when we speak up and don't get intimidated to not speak the truth to people, it puts shame on them, not on us. But if we don't speak up when we're supposed to, we're intimidated, then the shame comes on us. Friends, it's warfare. And I'm not glorifying the devil. He was defeated by the Messiah. He is defeated by the Messiah. And he will always be defeated by the Messiah. Scripture tells us that. Scripture tells us that. He was defeated by the Messiah. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. And I'm doing this out of the King James Version. Now is the judgment of this world. Shall be the prince of this world be cast out. Now the word shall here, shall the prince of this world be cast out. It is future tense. Will is future. Revelation 12 tells you when he's going to be cast out of heaven. When that battle between Michael and his angels, and they throw him out. So this, you got to read, when you read this, it's future tense in that part. Going on. John chapter 14, verse 30. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and have nothing in me. Prince of this world cometh, and he have nothing in me. You have got to walk like the Messiah and get your life inside whole. Deal with the iniquitous roots of brokenheartedness, John. You have to deal with those issues. This is an interesting reference. John 16.11. Does that number ring a bell? 16.11. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. This word judged in 16.11, John 16.11, is the same word judged that I talked about last week from 1 Corinthians 11. It means to decide, discern, discriminate, and judge or render a verdict. Of judgment, deciding, discerning, uh, discriminating, and rendering a verdict because the prince of this world is been decided, been discerned, been discriminated, and been judged. Verdict has been rendered on him. Colossians 2.15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Scripture is crystal clear. The enemy is defeated. There's no question about it. We have to walk in the same victory the Messiah walked in. However, all this is true. The enemy is whipped. The Messiah will be. However, this does not mean that he's not working in the world today. If these verses meant that the devil is no longer active in deceiving, killing, stealing, and destroying, and murdering, why do we even have John 10.10? 10? 
The thief comes not but to kill, to steal, and destroy, but I come to give life, and life more abundantly. Why would we even have that if it's not true? Why do we have the Ephesians 6 account of spiritual warfare? And nothing less than it says, for we wrestle not. Say wrestle. What's that doing in the Scripture? When you wrestle somebody, you are locking hand-to-hand -hand combat with them. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. What is that word wrestle even doing in that text? Hello? It means that you can end up in a situation where you're hand-to-hand -hand dealing with principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, or spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, to God be the glory. I, you know, say a lot. So let me come. I love the Father. I love what He's doing. Yes. Wrestle in Strong's is number 2076. And it the, the last word they use to define this is wrestle. Webster Dictionary says wrestle. To contend with grappling and striving to trip or throw an opponent down or off balance. The enemy doesn't necessarily want to take you out every time. He just want to keep you from God's purposes. Right. All he's got to do is get you off balance. Right. And he's got you. And that's the purpose of this wrestling, this hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's just to throw you off balance. To get you out of the perfect will of God. To just create an environment where you're confused. And anytime you're confused, no, that's the Babylonian calling card, man. They are experts at confusion. I mean, they got confusion coming every which way. So that's one thing when you're walking into some warfare and you, there's confusing thoughts. That's, a, that's their card, man. That's their signature. Confusion. So back out of the confusion. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, one of my favorite verses about spiritual warfare. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Can you quote it? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The word strongholds in Scripture is apostolic career. And it means warfare. It means you're dealing. And that, that, I think it's that word. It's one of the words in there. It actually means a career of warfare. A career of it. Timothy, like a good soldier. Soldiers call it a warfare. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the true knowledge of God and bringing every thought captive to the obedience of the Messiah. In my favorite verse in verse 6. And having all readiness to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Wow. I've been hanging on that promise for some time now. And meditate on it. It's a complicated promise to get. I've meditated on it for years before I understood it. Still don't know if I can tell you what it means. But in my spirit, I am 100 percent sure. It means that when I live right and obey what, what the Father has called me to obedience him, he's going to punish everything that has come against me. Hallelujah. Why is Revelation 12 even in the scripture if it's all over with? That the angel, the, the, the Michael, the angel Michael and his angels, scripture's clear if you read it, and his angels fought with the devil and they threw him out and his place was found no more. Where did they throw him? Down to the earth. Why does it say submit to God and resist the devil? Why does it even say that? Submit to God. Most people get the resist the devil part, but they don't get the submit to God part. The submit to God part is let God deal with you. So when it's time to resist the devil, there's nothing in you to give him credit. What does it even say? Let's just read some text there in, in James chapter 4. 
Let's just read some text here. That's, that's good stuff. James chapter 4. It was right after Hebrews. Right after Hebrews. Why well, I read the whole chapter, but we can get to that. Um, verse 6. For he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Who's the most arrogant, proudful being that ever is existing? Satan. But God gives grace to the humble. Who's the humblest man that's ever been on earth? Yeshua the Messiah. Which one are we supposed to be like? The Messiah. What that, what's the trait of the Messiah? Humility. Therefore, submit to God. Humble yourself and, and submit every area, every thought, every desire, every bit of your physical health to God. Resist the devil he will fear from you. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of Jehovah. And he will lift you up. Hallelujah. The, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to read another text on this. But I want to tell you in chapter 1 that the testing of your faith is more precious than gold. Because the gold in this earth, no matter what it goes for an ounce, these days or days ago, it's temporary. It's temporary. And the gold that you and I do not see right now called tested faith. Can you say tested faith? Yes. Come on, say tested faith. Yes. Tested faith is more precious than gold. When your faith is tested, anybody got faith testing going on? Huh? Anybody got some faith testing going on? Yeah. Forget the test, man. Think about what's happening in eternity. It's turning into everlasting Gold, not temporary gold. It's more precious than gold. Say, my faith that's being tested is more precious than the gold on earth and all of it put together. You know, I was, I'm was i going to give this testimony. I'm going to not disclose the name here. But uh, I was talking with someone this week representing the business. And uh, they have a devotional in their company and each one of the sales engineers or whatever they technically call them brings the devotional every week. And when the owner's son did the devotional. And when the guy told me what he did the devotional, Susan was listening. And when he told me what the devotional was, I said, wow. The devotional was run to chaos. Run to chaos. Not draw back, not hide in a hole, not go leave this country by a house somewhere else because trouble's coming. Uh, but run to it. You know why anybody in Scripture that saw a giant and ran to it? He ran to it. He ran to it. David ran to the battle. Who do you think his mentor was? Don't answer that. It was not his father. Because his father didn't really even consider him to exist as a son. Because when Samuel, the prophet, said, bring me your sons, David wasn't even in the way. Who was mentoring? He was being mentored by the Spirit out in the field as a shepherd. And he was dealing with lions and bears. And only two attributes I want to bring in about dealing with a lion and dealing with a bear is that a lion is really quick and really loud. An aggressive, flesh-eating, fearful type being. A bear doesn't come at you secretly or quickly. He's just big and full of power. And so there's there's two kinds of spiritual forces you got to be able to deal with right there. You got to be able to deal with a spirit that comes at you like a lion. It's quick. It's got fat. I mean, it's aggressive. And, you, and it may come quickly from a direction you don't see. And then there's the bear. 
The bear's just great, big, huge, and he's there to tear things up. And they can intimidate you. You have to deal with that kind of spirit before you're ready to deal with that skin-wearing hybrid Nephilim who is part human and part monster, if you will. Guess what? The Master said in Matthew 24 as in the days of Noah. You know what was walking around in the days of Noah? Skin-wearing, demonized, Nephilim. I'm fairly sure that's going to happen again. The bigger opportunity that came after he was successful and dealing with the spirits of darkness called a lion and a bear. The greater opportunity came and he was ready. Say ready. ready. Say he was ready. ready. Say I want to be ready. When that Nephilim showed up, he didn't cower back with the whole army of Israel and say, oh my God, this devil is so big. Who's going to deal with that? I mean, he was aching. He was yearning to run and head on to this skin-wearing Nephilim monster demonized thing. And I don't know what all to call him, but that's just what I think he is. He didn't have any fear. He, he, he was waiting. For the divine moment to run in on into that thing. Hallelujah. It may be coming again. And it may be soon. I'm praying for sooner than later. I mean, they're thinking about building the third temple, and I'm thinking about sending them a donation. I want that done. My father wants it done. He wants to shoot mess over with. He's tired of seeing humanity suffer. He's tired of seeing people being deceived and drugged into hell. He's had it up to here and he's about to call a name. So, yeah, I'm thinking about sending up a donation. I'm going to get it done, man. I'm not really going to send up a donation. But I'd like to. <laughs> anyway. Nehemiah said this, and I'm saying this to you. Nehemiah said, I'm here for the battle. What are you here for? What am I here for? What am I here for? Nehemiah said, I'm here for the battle. Now, I'm not saying you generate warfare. I tested before and after I said that statement in the spirit, live in the service last week when I said, I'm not comfortable being comfortable. I test that before and after I said it. I mean, I had to decide, is the Spirit really telling me to say this? Because I knew what the consequence of it would be. So I'm not into just like draw a line across it. When the Father says this is the battle, then you do it. And friends, what the line in the bear for? Just get the fear out of you. I'm telling you, some of you get healed if you just face fear. Some of you just get healed if you just face fear. And you can't you can cast the demon of fear out, but you can't conquer the fear that's in your flesh unless you face the fear that's in your flesh. Hello? You got to face that stuff, man. It's not going away because you're a nice person. It's not going away because you've got a nice husband or a nice wife or a nice assembly. It's not going away. Give us this day our day and night. I want to win every day. I want to win from my master and I want to enjoy the victory myself. Amen? So, Father, we just give you glory and praise today. We just give you all the battle stuff and all that stuff that goes with that, Father. We just give all that to you. And we just thank you for the victory in battle if we trust you. We're not trying to start a battle. 
We're not trying to glorify the enemy and say he's something he's not. All we're saying, Father, is that we want to glorify you by winning in every battle. Even the little ones where, where, we're, where we're talked out of being obedient. We're talked out of giving, praying, attending. We're talked out of uh, uh, witnessing or laying hands on the sick. Or we're talked out of uh, holding our peace and, and not getting angry and letting stuff out. Father, just in any and every way, let us give us this day our daily battle. Father, we give you the glory in Yeshua's name.